Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Iowa soccer supporters. I'm Ben Brackett, Soccer Talk co-host here with my pal, Blake Siebers. Siebes, what's up? Ben, good to be back in the studio. Good to be back at uh, continuing to cover the high school sports, high school soccer specifically. Yeah, right on. I'm glad to see you've uh, adopted the, the mic stand that I have. You sound great today. Um, Thanks. So, I mean, there's our YouTube plug. Yeah. Check Subscribers have been blowing up, actually. So we're on YouTube. Search Kick It Forward. Uh, we got our goals of the week on there. We've got our podcast that uh, you guys can watch us see, see what we're up to, see the check out the space. We turn the lights on. Um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Lights, especially. Um, uh, Titan Tactician in the house today. Uh, we took a little road trip last night out west uh, to Perry, take in the Blue Jay battle, the Bondurant Blue Jay, Bondurant for our Blue Jays against the Perry Blue Jays. All right, let's get, uh, let's get a Titan Tactician in and get to it. All right, Titan Tactician, what's up, man? Welcome back. Hey, guys, good to be back. Uh, what's this, number three or four? Three. Three. Game of the week, number three. Uh, as everybody knows, we took in the Blue Jay battle this evening, uh, yesterday night, I guess I should say. Um, what'd you think? A little road trip. A little road trip up 141 to Perry, Iowa, uh, where they took on Bondurant. So, um, but that's when we took a little pit stop right before, didn't we? We did at the mini pitch. Of, it was uh, it was fun to see it. There was a little action going on too. Yeah. So check out our stories on Instagram. Um, it was being used there at P Perry Elementary. It's getting painted here about this time next month or so, right? Yes, sir. And that was the first time I've seen the mini pitch in Perry. And I was pleasantly surprised. That is really cool. I, lo I just love the idea, though, some of these mini pitches being in the uh, on school grounds. I think the one that we've got in Lamoni, uh, right outside the, the back door of the elementary elementary school gets used like every day by tons of kids, um, which is awesome. And then, so I just, when we, when we rolled up there to, to, to the school in Perry, uh, it's a much bigger facility than is Lamoni, uh, but it's actually a lot nicer. And that pitch is right there in the, I mean, kids can just walk out at recess or at gym time right out the back door of the school and they're on the mini pitch. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's uh, right off of <clears throat> like bike path, you know, the rest of the parks right there, uh, rooftops all around it. So, um, so on the other side of town, big high school game, um, I guess, it, Perry's had kind of a tough start to the year. It looks like, um, I, th I think really it kind of only got a little worse for him last night. Yeah. I mean, Bondurant didn't give him much time though, did they? <laughs> no, we walked up actually on time and, uh, in time enough to see the first two goals scored in the first two minutes. Yeah, I think one of you guys mentioned historically, actually, Perry's had the better side of Bondurant. So isn't that, um, isn't that, I mean. I think our source said 12, the last 12 meetings, Perry has come out on top. So and I think it was Bondurant, Matt Co uh, coaches, Matt Cox, his first ever win over Perry. And that's interesting because you would have never known it just by going to the one off last night. I mean, you, you showed up there and it, it didn't look like Bondurant was overturning a run of a bunch of games, not having beaten the, the, the same opponent. It, they looked pretty comfortable in the game. And as the goals sort of rained down, um, there wasn't a whole lot of celebration coming from the Bondurant crowd. Um, so maybe they've just, they've got a good team and that's kind of what their expectations are now, but uh, yeah, they, they totally controlled and dominated the the game. I think it's interesting, Ben, you talk about Perry getting off to a slow start this year. Traditionally, they've been um, they've been a strong program. And just looking at their schedule, it's interesting. I mean, they play some of the schools they played. Um, you know, they're a, a 1A school or no, 2A, sorry. But, you know, they played North, um, Des Moines North, which is a bigger school. You know, they've played the Marshalltown, which is ranked in 3A. Adell is ranked. Uh, North Polk was the number one seed two years ago. Green County was is ranked. So, um, so because they're definitely of their, some some top teams. Yeah. So maybe because of their history a little bit, they've uh, loaded up that schedule and maybe just been dealt a tough hand. 
Yeah, and maybe the maybe the team's just not quite as good this year too as it's been in the past. But a couple um, of young boys in mid, a couple of freshmen in midfield, which it's like the trend lately, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and I, I actually think the the individual players in Perry are actually pretty good. Um, I think their their biggest issue is how they operate uh, collectively. Um, so, um, I mean, I thought, I mean, even even despite the score, which ended up being what seven to two. Um, that the the back four and, and the goalkeeper um, did as best as they could. Um, so, uh, and I thought all four of the defenders in the back four repair are actually good. So going left to right, you've got um, Alex Bonuelos, number 22 is their left back. Um, then they got uh, Abner Rivera, number 24 was their center back. Um, number four, Christian Chavez, probably for me, their best player. Uh, played in their back four as well. Um, and then also wearing the armband, right? He also, I mean, he was at the mini pitch tournament, got injured, plugged Mm. there. And then Jeremy Matuso, uh, or Matesso, sorry if I mispronounced that, was their right back, number 17, also a really good player. And, and for those four guys, and then the goalkeeper behind them, I mean, they just had a tough night. I mean, Perry's midfield, um, really did little to, to help them in terms of denying the supply into Bondurant's front runners. And so often the ball was getting in behind the back four um, or getting into Bondurant's players' feet who were able to turn and, and cause real problems for the back four. Um, and so I actually think that with some pretty simple um, changes or adjustments that that Perry actually could could stop leaking so many chances for Bondurant and and really tighten things up at the back. And for me, it's all about their midfielders. Um, so they played with. Um, it looked to me like they were playing in four four two. Um, so, you know, when when Bondurant would get the ball. Um, and let's just say that Bondurant's center back or left back got the ball. Um, if you were to, to take a snapshot and a picture at that moment, let's just say that the, the right backs got the ball and Bondurant's strikers are sort of advancing up the, up the field, pushing the back four of, of, of Perry back, who were trying to keep a, a high line. Perry's midfielders, um, and we'll just start with the two center center midfielders were already high up the pitch, you know, towards Bondurant's back four and, and normally square. Um, and then what would also happen would be that Perry's wide midfielders. Um, so it was number six and number seven on the left. And then number 15 on the right, when the ball was on the opposite when the ball was on the opposite side to the midfielder. So if it's with the, the right back for Bondurant, the right midfielder for Perry would usually drop all the way back um, with the back line. So they were defending with five. And so I get the picture I'm trying to create is one where there is just yards and yards of space in midfield. And so in my hypothetical, what that allows the right back for Bondurant to do is essentially select his pass um, because Bondurant was playing with three central midfielders. And so if on the on, on Perry side of the ball, if you've got your two central midfielders who are square and high up the, the, the field, you're already operating at, at a man down, three versus two. Um, but then if you're square and you don't have really any sort of structure or depth in midfield, you really allow lots of passes to bypass midfield easily and get into the striker's feet. And that's what just happened over and over again. So when we grew up playing, Matt, everybody played, like almost everybody played 4-4-2, correct? Um, you'd, always, you'd always have that two players in midfield. And then as we got a little older, the trend has really become three center midfielders, right? And <clears throat> rarely are teams coached, it seems, to deal with that um, – numbers disadvantage in the situation where they actually run into it if they're you know and and if it's two against three they just don't know how to deal with it right three against two no problem but um what are some ways that 
Are you going to solve the problem for us? I mean, I could give you a couple ideas, but I want you to solve it for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just, from what I saw last night, a very simple solution would have been, well, let's go back to my hypothetical. So Bonnerant right back gets the ball, right? And there's, there's three of his midfielders in midfield, and then there's two people ahead of the ball. Because when, when later in the second half, at least, they were playing in 3-5-2, actually. So still with those three, three central midfielders. Bonnerant, anyway. Um, first of all, the two central midfielders for Perry can't be square, they, and they can't be high up the field. They have to be dropped back and in, and they've got to be staggered. So at least then you're dealing with two versus three. That often wasn't what was happening. It was probably one versus three because one of the midfielders were all the way up by their own strikers. But the second, second thing that can happen, so if you get your, your two central midfielders staggered and you get depth in midfield, um, the right midfielder for Perry, all he needs to do is just tuck in and get all the way across. And so if you do that, you actually now have three players in midfield and you're operating more three versus three, as opposed to, you know, one versus three or two versus three. Um, and so what you have to do is you have to pass players on, or you have to trust your back four to be able to deal with, with bond ramp players who are advancing up the field and just get tighter in and compact the space. And realistically, the ball wasn't going wide often for bond ramp, in my opinion, so they could have actually tucked both of their, their midfielders in in a lot of circumstances, maybe have gone four versus three. And if you do that, if you get players in the middle of the field, what you're going to do is you're going to stop the supply into Bondurant's front two, which their best player, I think, is, is Oscar. Um, what's his last name? White. Oscar White, um, who scored a bunch of the goals. But, but if you do that, and Bondurant tries to pass it into Oscar's feet, they're not going to be able to because your midfielders are going to deny the supply into the front front two. And you will also take all sorts of pressure off the back four. So what was happening, because, because these midfielders were all the way wide or all the way pushed back into the back line when they were defending, and be, because the central midfielders were either square or high up the field, the ball would get played into the striker's feet or even into midfield before the strikers, and it was pulling players like, uh, Christian Chavez and was pulling players like Abner Rivera into midfield. And so then you have an unbalanced back line and all of a sudden you get little balls played in and slipped in behind you. And so it's completely disciplined. It's completely shaped for Perry. And if they did that and if they got some discipline in their, in their team, when they were on the defensive side of the ball, you would see real differences, I think, because on the ball, I think they're great. I think a number of those players are very technical, um, they can strike a ball. Um, and you saw them score a couple of goals too. So a couple they, of the, the goal that we saw as we were, uh, like walking right in front of that goal was, was a really nice little build up, a sweet little ball through and a great finish. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just going to say too, the, the funny thing about that sort of weak side midfielder you're talking about, who's saying, you know, dropping all the way back into the back. And then as a result, you've got center backs, um, uh, going into midfield that, that weak side midfielder is not really doing anything. Right. He's just sort of hanging out. He's just like, well, I'm back. So not only is he like done a little extra work, he's not very useful. Like he could just pinch in less work. And then if the right back goes, well, I don't have any, the boundary right back says, Hey, I can play into midfield. Oh, nothing's on. Well, what, are, what are you usually going to do? Okay. I'm going to turn around play it to my center back and switch it out the other side. Now that weak side midfielder is there to step up and press. And it's just like a little bit of a sort of a swing back and forth. And then hopefully boundary just pumps it into the, box and where are they the best probably in their center backs right mm -hmm. uh, perry right well, i think they i mean to talk about the environment in the field a little bit right i got a little nostalgia there the old school that's right football field um super crown but super narrow mm -hmm. so perry doesn't i mean you guys where you guys are talking about having a boy pinch in he doesn't have to really go that far no, it's, it's a little work isn't very it? narrow yeah <laughs> what um, about matt did you is that the kind of field that you guys played on with the the titans uh or were they you know like since they're big catholic high school they have a real nice pitch we had a pretty nice field um Weird. it was <laughs> we did play on a football field in the football stadium but i want to say that they may have even widened it for the soccer field because maybe maybe there was some like 
maintenance to the track or a new track that got put down or something like that. I don't know. For but Blake we and were... I, we always played on a small crowned football okay. field. Like, yeah. That was like, like the full flush, grass, like super long grass, super thick, obviously for fall football games, right? They don't yeah. want it to Almost torn never up. did you play on like an actual soccer field. Right. Well, that's the other piece too. To, to And I think you said that, for, but for last night too, it's like not only is the field narrow, but they're, the grass is clumpy. And so the ball just doesn't move. And so you, you get, if you, if you make the space really small, you can get to almost everything. And if you can't get to the ball, usually you can get to the guy. And so, if, you know, if all sort of else fails, you can maybe have a tactical foul or something like that. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was a narrow field, but the game was wide open. How much different would the game have been if it had been on turf? You think it would have been like a higher, higher score? Do you think it would work to Perry's advantage? Depends on how they set up on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, if it, I think if it was the same game as last night, but just on turf, it, it would have been way more than seven to two. Yeah, because they would have gotten so pulled all. Perry would have gotten pulled all over the place. Yeah, that that could be true, but but then the other side of it too is, I mean, I mean, I mean, Bondurant's got some nice players. I don't think that every single one of them is really really technical, um, but they they've got good players. But you know, when you play on turf, that ball moves so quickly too. Sometimes it can just end up out of bounds all the time. So who knows? That's what they, I mean, they got in behind Perry a few times and the ball did just kind of die just checked on that <laughs> grass. So they were, they had success where on turf, it may just run to the goalkeeper. That's but, a good point. Well, uh, talk a little bit about the Bondurant players. Um, you, know, you, you mentioned they've got some nice ones. Yeah. Like I said, I like, I like Oscar. Um, what's his last name? Mean? Oscar. Oscar White. Is it Oscar White? Oh, they got well, I don't know. That's what Blake said. And I'm, I'm, uh, I don't Wait. have a roster in front of me. Who's number 10? I thought it was. I might have the wrong guy. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at the JV roster. That's why. No, the Titan there's tactician. Another, well, there's another Zach Oscar. Klein, number two is good, there's and then an Oscar, Oscar the White, number side. ten, the big, the big man that played up top. Yeah, there's an Oscar Cruz. On, so, on sounds JV. like we've got a little JV Titan tactician here today yeah. too. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> messed that one up. Yeah, so Oscar White, I think he's their, their best player, right? I mean, didn't even hat trick. Like he, he scored the first three goals or three of the hat trick in the first half, I think. Yeah, scored and, another one late, and, and I remember him from the mini pitch too tournament. He was he was quite good. He's one of their best players, so I really liked him. Um, I also liked uh, number thirteen, Sam McClintock. Was he the who was the Jesse Baker? That's him. That was him. Okay, Jesse Baker looked like. <laughs> and Sam, if you're listening, that's a that's a huge compliment, by the way. Um, noticed your hair, and then you just kind of a smooth player in midfield, as was Jesse Baker, who was, you know, one probably you know one of the top. Drake players um, ever to play. And I, I mean, think he was actually MV, MVC player of, the, player of the year. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, Smooth but, operator for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's the first thing we said when we walked up, right? Oh, there's a Jesse Baker out there. Um, <laughs> and again, that's a compliment to you, Sam. So he's a good, good player. I mean, I think that's why, I mean, when, and, and he had all sorts of time and space in the ball too. So he can get it and sort of, you know, sprinkle the ball wherever he really wanted to. What do you think of number two? I, I liked him a little more than the other two. Uh, that Zach Kleine kind of played out wide, then moved in midfield kind of a little bit all over the place, Matt. Yeah, I, I also liked him. I, I thought he ended up playing. So I thought Baker, Baker's not Baker, uh, McClintock, <laughs> Sam McClintock actually would probably usually come a little bit um, more towards the defender, just come and get the ball. Um Whereas Zach Klein stayed a little bit higher and closer to um, the front two and Oscar and um, number nine, he was Titus Cram. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th I thought those two guys, they, they give their midfield good balance. Um, both guys, it looks like they can run box to box and even interchange with each other. So um, you know, I liked both of them. After our in-game interview with assistant coach, Matt Cox, uh, he mentioned Head coach or Matt Cox. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 Brandon Cook. I apologize. I just got him. I, you know, I did all that social media. I'm, I'm the JV boy over here. And I, um, so the, he was just mentioning that that number two, um, not only good player, but then like had some summer plans to go play somewhere where like he might continue to really improve anyway. So I just thought that, I mean, is he a younger player? Junior it says. Okay. He was technical though. Yeah, but I think, I mean, the biggest point, right? I mean, Bondurant never gave Perry a chance going 2-0 up within the first two, three minutes. And unfortunately, that was just, they put their foot on it and didn't let off. Yeah, that was, it was over at 2-0. Um, and then wasn't the third goal a penalty as well? It was. So, I mean, you're at 3-0. 
what with 15 minutes left or so in the first half and well, and the penalty it just, gone. It was, it was an obvious penalty and it's we one, could hear it. We yeah. could hear the kick from where we were at, <laughs> but it was one where like it happened and it, you could tell like the whole Perry team, you know, they were just like, def- you know, they were like, defeated. Yeah, they were defeated. And it came from a corner kick too. So it's a set piece. Uh, Bondurant brought a couple of guys out short and, you know, it's one of those where you know, defensively Perry just wasn't prepared or I think looking that the ball was going to come in short and, and, and the, I think was it Oscar that got fouled too? I think it might have been him or somebody got somebody looked like him got fouled to me anyway. Um, basically just dribbled all the way in the box, beat a player, and then he just got, you know, kicked down. And it was an easy call for the referee. It was inter- I mean, go ahead, Ben. No, you're fine. I was just talking about Bondurant's schedule a little bit. They've uh I mean they've had some they haven't been in a lot of close competitive games. You know, they've uh, I mean four nil, nine zero, five one. 7 1 now 7 2 they've won are they playing teams like in comparison with perry or you know and then they've lost a couple right they lost to east who's a 3a school and then they lost to nevada who just came out who's ranked number five and bondurant's number six what so was the score in that game um that game was in nevada's favor 3-1 but you just wonder you know it's hard to keep the boys engaged right for the whole when you're four nil up at halftime and perry hasn't had much of the ball um which they were able to get a couple back late. Yeah, I'd imagine too. For it seems like there are a number of games in high school matches where the game is lopsided, right, in terms of score. Um, and so it'd be interesting to know just from some of the coaches' perspectives what they do or what they talk about to keep the players engaged in those sorts of situations. Because there's certainly things you can still work on. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you up four nil, I mean, what's the motivation? to, I mean, just keep, you know, pounding someone. Well, and then the flip, um, flip side of that, if you're the coach of the other team, like how do you, I mean, you want to stop the bleeding, obviously, but how do you keep a team motivated that's obviously like game's over? Well, that's you know, what they're on the losing side of it. But yeah, right. so Matt Cox talked about, right? Like, hey, it's, we got bigger plans, guys. Like if you think we're really good, like we're doing it in Perry on a Tuesday night, like we want to be mid-May, 1st of June. We County. Be, exactly. So I think that's, but again, how do you like, you said, how do you get that message across and to them so they actually listen to it? Yeah, I think a, another kind of unique thing about the high school season is just like how thick and fast the games are. I mean, a lot of times these guys are playing, you know, maybe twice during the week, and then occasionally they have a tournament on the weekend. Um, so they're at least playing twice a week. So that leaves, you know, probably two recovery days and like two pregame practices. So you're really like, maybe you get to train a, a single day, maybe, maybe like a real training session. So I, I just wonder what, you know, what are, th- how are these coaches, you know, what are they doing to, to affect their teams? And, um, you know, not, I'm not trying to be negative more, just like what, what can you do? Um, you know, how do you find a way to improve your squad when you can't really train them too hard because they've got to perform every other night. Right. And that's why I, I think in high school soccer, it, a, a lot of that preparation uh, probably should or, or must take place i mean during some of these games that are even lopsided right i mean you can still work on stuff you can still work on keeping the ball you can work on team shape sure and i I just worry if you know if you're like the team losing how do you like get out of that funk if you can't like have some time to train so anyway it's just a challenge i think you probably don't yeah well exactly um it's moment it's momentum right we talked about that with van meter a little bit they started off slow and all of a sudden they won they won again last night in penalties so they've won Did they really? four in a row or whatever now and yeah. who'd they beat last night underwood hmm. yeah i don't know I, I would just like to i think for some of these programs like like in perry's situation you know i don't know what they're doing in training but if they took some time and worked on some of those things like you know some defensive shape things um you know they protect their goalkeeper a ton in that and that maybe in that situation and they're able to keep you know if they don't give up three goals in the first 15 minutes that's a totally different game Um, if they don't give a goal in the first minute, it's a totally different game and they just weren't organized. So Mm -hmm. I I just think that would be, um, you know, I always think about that. I was talking to another, uh, not to be named coach who was, um, talking about how they had a bunch of time and it's like, well, all I would be doing with, with some extra time is training defensive shape and set pieces so that when it comes time to win games, like, you know, in a game like that for Perry, if they say, you know what, we need to win tonight against bond Grant, let's just shut it down and let's get our goal and win one zero. I don't see a lot of teams doing that. I, I think instead they go, well, let's just go out and play and like, we'll play the way we play. And oh shoot, it's three nil. 
what do we do now? We can't get back in the game. So yeah. I don't know. I, my, my, I would just approach it in this, in high school soccer. I would be, if I was the coach, I would be approaching every game as a, like, I want to win every single game. Oh yeah. I, I think you're totally right. I think that's because you've got such a short space of time and you know, the, the, the knockout round games are coming up soon, right? It's what they call them substate. And yeah. And state that, but and that's what like you're that. training for. You're essentially yeah. training for a, an end of the season tournament. Cause Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a great example. Of, um, you know, like the Iowa uh, Hawkeye women, I don't know if you saw that they like, they, they, in their big 10 season, they went like two and eight or something like that, maybe two, eight and one. And then they, they did, wouldn't have normally gotten in the tournament, but they did because of the COVID hmm. and went on a run, won four games or five games in a row and they're big 10 champs. I saw that. Yeah. You know, and that's, but it's the same. I mean, Perry could literally lose out all year. And if they like improve and substate comes around, win three games, go to state, win three games, they're state champs. Hmm. That's, I mean, which to me, it's, it, that would be the, no matter what team I'm coaching, that would, I would be like, okay, let's go to win every single game so that when it matters, we're prepared to win every single game. That's true. So I, I guess I didn't even realize that. So you could Everybody go. Everybody qualifies for substate. Really? So you can go in 12 in your initial games and you could just be hammering. I mean, just shape, just, just making yourself super hard to break down. Yeah. You could, and you then could lose every single game one zero. You could be working all these trick plays and <laughs> like penalty, you know, set pieces and stuff like that defensive and offensive and then like you said just turn it on turn on the light switch it's upstate yeah that's pretty interesting well i know i know like waukee did that a few years ago you know they they rotated their squad a bunch and they didn't have the best record but by the time they got to substate everybody was rested and ready to go and they just steamrolled that was that first year they won it yep yeah i I remember that because they were they were they took a different approach to how they scheduled games. And I think they backed off a little bit. Yep. Um, maybe only played eight or 10 regular season games. They had a big contingent of club players that had a really busy spring with some, you know, additional stuff. So they said, okay, let's let them do that for their development, but mm-hmm. let's also pump the brakes, you know, during the week and stuff. And maybe let some other guys play. Who's going to challenge Waukee this year. I'd like to see those guys get knocked off. <laughs> That'd be a, no offense Joaquin, but i mean not having nobody right now it doesn't look like well, i think that's, that's looks like something. they're building a little bit of a dynasty out there i don't know is it i mean come on where are the tigers i mean yeah somebody no. ankeny dewey well, where are you at i mean you look at their they've played i mean if you want to like laugh at something here here's their scores that they've all won by the way three zero ten zero ten zero four zero eight zero ten zero five one four zero five zero ten zero like it doesn't sound very fun have they played any notables or i mean ames lincoln marshalltown so i mean sort of arguably yeah yeah some good teams but not but i mean this i mean i think maybe no ankeny matchup no no johnston centennial yet no i mean dowling no east east side schools either that'll be interesting right yeah i mean cedar rapids washington which isn't traditionally strong waterloo east cedar falls which Again, aren't Pleasant Valley, aren't maybe your Bettendorf's, your Iowa City West, Iowa City Highs. It'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see how they do. You know, uh, I think the, no matter who you are, or what you feel, when you see a team win a lot, uh, I think people either go, they kind of can jump on the bandwagon and say, you know what, we love uh, the Waukee Warriors. We think it's so great what they're doing. Or they go, you know, I'd love to see, you know, that you just sort of take that other approach of like, you know, I want to see some other teams win. And a lot of times that's, you, know, you start rooting for an underdog here or there and you find somebody else. So um, I think ultimately you just want to see like good, close parody, competitive right? games. Yeah. I think the thing that'll be interesting with that is, you know, they've won two years in a row now. Um, you know, three Pete would be unprecedented. Um, Has it happened in Iowa before? I don't think so. No Valley. Hmm. Never. No. Hmm. Bettendorf. I wonder. I think we won it back to back once in like the late nineties, but I was not a part of that squad. Um, anyway, so we've devolved a little bit, uh, good, a good game out, um, out in Perry, um, our inaugural blue Jay battle. Um, any other parting thoughts on, on the, that game? None for me. No, I would just say listeners keep those goals of the week coming in. Yeah. Right. Well, on. Shameless plug. We've gotten quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of, submissions the quality let's 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 work on the quality quality a little bit yeah yeah fair enough i kind of like that i I like the it looks like the home video-esque type feel i like that there i mean we asked will be interesting we asked for goal number what what one or two from last night was good and you look up and the the comment back was all right i'm gonna have 
Timmy's dad, who's got the little handheld, he was the only one recording. So, well, you wouldn't have got, you wouldn't have gotten, is it Will Curtis that, that sort of went over to the corner flag and had a little celebration? I mean, you wouldn't have had that, that in there, which was great, unless somebody was, you know, taking kind of more like a home video. So, I I don't, I mean, maybe you'd like the quality to be better in some of them, but at the same time, the authenticity of some of those videos is great. All right. Well, speaking of devolving, uh, anyway thank you guys for the videos keep them coming and uh regardless of the quality we will uh sift through them and pick out the best ones uh and by we i mean the committee so uh anyway we'll see you next week what's our game of the week next week blake so on tuesday night um one it's i'm you know i'm kind of sad that it's it's been moved to a tuesday but it's uh, our dmps big rivalry um roosevelt and lincoln that's right. Um, it used to be on the Friday night for, for years. Not sure what happened, but Jack and Matt, Reem, you guys get that sorted out back on a Friday night because that was, uh, that was awesome out there. So we'll see you Tuesday night. Right on. Fingers crossed for good. All right, Siebs. So finally getting into a little uh, groove with the uh, game of the week. Uh, that was our, you know, like, like Matt said, our third one in the books. Um, next week, we're, we get to stay local. Like you said, we're going to go down and check out Roosevelt Lincoln at County. Uh, what else is going on? You know, we, we're continuing to do our little clinics, Waterworks Park, 9 a.m. Saturdays. The crowd continues to grow. So parents keep bringing your little ones out there. Yeah, it's been fun, uh, especially for me, because I end up getting to take like all the older brothers that decide to come and uh i just basically like dominate them in 2v2 so yeah so we got that going on we got the eating contest tomorrow this will be airing on friday so tomorrow will be our last day um to fundraise for that but keep those coming in and uh what else ben yeah i don't know let's just keep rocking um lots of fun exciting mini pitch talk in the uh in the background going so you know stay tuned for that um talk to you next week mm-hmm.